So good afternoon, everyone. I have the difficult task to keep you awake after a light lunch, and I have also the difficult task to talk to you about transformation and new technology while being an incumbent telco company where the challenge is how are we dealing with the current disruption in the market. Very quickly, who we are, I don't know if everybody knows Proximus. We are the incumbent the main telco provider in Belgium. We have a 6 billion turnover, 14,000 people. And I think most important here is that we invest every single year 1 billion euro in network, in IT solution, and in content. So a huge amount of money for a small country like Belgium just to make sure that we can provide you or customers with the needed uh, data. Just as a matter of example, more and more the telco world is a world that goes exponential and no more linear. If you look at the consumption of mobile data, it is doubling every single year. If you put that in a graph, you really see like that the exponential curve. One of the main challenge we have as telco is how do we cope with these increasing demands? How do we make sure we have enough fund and authorization to invest in the network to answer the demand, and most of it, how do we make sure we get a return on investment? Because I am sure you are not ready to pay double the price every single year for the usage of data. So a big challenge for us is how you make that work. Another challenge, and sometimes I say we probably done a very bad work at marketing in the past, because if you look at Apple, for instance, everybody is very happy to pay 900 euro to buy a new iPhone every two years. But nobody is happy to pay 20 euro a month just to make it work. And that's very often what Telco asks, is around 20 euro a month on average ARPU to make it work. And every two years, you're ready to pay 900. So there is a very strong imbalance in the perception in terms of how you make it work, the price you pay for that, and the price of the smartphone or the iPhone. So in that sense, probably very bad work done by Telco in the past uh, to make sure that you understand the big investment that is needed just to provide uh, the, right, um, the right technology. Very quickly, I mean, how do we cope with the changes? We are disrupted. We are disrupted by OTT in the content area, like the Netflix of this world, the HBO of this world. We are disrupted very much on voice by uh, people like uh, WhatsApp, like Microsoft with Skype. So more and more of our industry, which used to have quite a lot of revenue from voice, is more and more disrupted on this area. And we are more and more becoming data provider. And if you say data provider, the question is how you monetize it or you avoid to become a dumb pipe. And so the whole question is how do you make sure you provide your customer not with products, not with infrastructure, but with solutions, with services that answer their needs and thereby climbing up the ladder of value by having your network component, having your platform component, and having your application component and providing customers with full solutions. Here, uh, some of them on the consumer side, we of course make sure that you can work on all devices, so integrating fixed and mobile, making sure you have access to all the content by being an aggregator of content, making sure you can get the main channels, the sports, the OTT that are easily integrated in the platforms on all the devices, on the big screen, on the lap, on the tablet, on, the, on, on your mobile, and of course making sure that more and more everything you use at home is being secured, is being easy to use, integrating cloud solutions, integrating security options, integrating uh, Microsoft Office, for instance, to make sure that you can work with that. That's, for instance, what we try to do in the um, consumer world. If I go to the enterprise market, there we evolve very much from a very much telco based in the past to more and more IT and application solution. You see here some of them where in the past it was very much just about network. Now it's more and more about services, more and more about collaboration, more and more about a data center, about the internet of things, about security. And that's how I think we as Telco needs to adapt ourselves in this world by bringing more and more solutions, more and more services to our customers and integrating them in comprehensive and integrated uh, solutions. One of the challenges to do that is that in the past we have been very much technology focused 
and we pushed technology to customer, while we try now much more to be customer focused and to really understand what are the needs of our customers and how can we use technology to help the customer fulfill their needs. So it's a very, it looks very easy, but it's very complex for big organization to really change the focus. If you ask, when I started in, in the telco industry, I'm in telco industry for five years before I was in the FMCG industry, so I'm much more a marketeer and salesperson than a technology person. And in the beginning when I entered the company and I had very bright engineers coming and showing me their latest technology and I said, fine, but what does it bring me? What, how does it change my life as a customer or as a consumer or as an enterprise? And to be honest, very often I had a big blank. And I said, yeah, but that's a fantastic technology. Don't you see it? And I said, no, I don't see it. And I know that I speak to a lot of IT people here. Just be aware of that, that it's not easy for your customers or for consumers to understand how technology works. And you need also probably to do the effort of explaining what does it bring to your customers to really make sure that you have a relevant story to your, um, to your audience. And it is becoming more and more complex because technology is becoming more and more complex. I will skip that one for the sake of time. So one of our key challenges is that how do we transform our company to become much from a telco and sometimes an ICT provider to a digital service provider and with a very strong customer focus, not only a technology focus. So not easy to do. A few examples of what we have done. We have, for instance, invested uh, a lot in mobility. If you work in Brussels, you know that mobility is quite an issue in this country. Uh, we have taken a, a majority stake in a few companies, uh, which is now called B Mobile, where we really try to use big data, to use information, to provide mobility solutions to companies and to customer. We have multimodal uh, applications, we have traffic management application, we do CITS development, for instance, in the Netherlands. So that's one example of how technology can really help you by collecting data, by having real-time algorithm and composing very, very different sources of data, how that can really bring added value to companies, but also to a country. Smart retail is another example. We have invested together with other companies in city. City is a kind of application that starts from the city, where the city brings all their tourism, administrative, relevant information to the people traveling in the city, but where on the same time, all the retailer, all the small uh, shops can put their information, can have access to an e-commerce site, and can also have a whole loyalty card. So that's a way as well to recreate local ecosystems where you integrate city advantages, parking advantages, shop advantages, and provide them a service that very often only big companies can have access to. There's also a way how we, as local provider, against sometimes very big competitors, uh, like a few I have named, like the Facebooks and, and the Google and uh, the Microsoft of this world, how we think we can add value in our position by creating new type of ecosystem, integrating different data, uh, and providing that to smaller local players that normally are not able to, uh, to develop that. I have to look at the time and go faster. So we do that, as I've said, sometimes in investing in companies, sometimes in partnerships, sometimes in co-creation. We are more and more opening up our assets to local um, players like SMS, like carrier billing, like uh, voice. These are all we built APIs whereby most of these assets are now available for startups, for small companies, where they have all their ideas in terms of application, in terms of new ideas, but they can use or assets or infrastructure to develop it. Internet of Things is also a very important one where we provide access to sensor, to platform, to first um, logarithm and algorithm for small companies to be able to develop application uh, based on the Internet of Things, which of course is uh, something that will still grow a lot in the future. Uh, the challenges for us to get there is how do you transform a company which used to be very much a hardware company, an infrastructure company, into much more a solution company, customer-based company and not technological-based, and where you have to work much faster 
than in the past. You have to work about UI, user experience, you have to work around solutions, you have to work in small teams, you have to work in the agile mode with the Scrum methodology, with co-creation, design thinking with customer. So a hell of a job, I would say, in terms of transformation of uh, a relatively big company to do that. So it's a lot of talking, it's a lot of communication, it's a lot of training, and I'm sure you are confronted in your job with probably the same type of question, and it's also very much working together, IT, business, customer, together in small teams. This is the only way I think it can work. If we continue to work in separate silos, we will never be able to cope with the fast-changing environment around us. And perhaps I couldn't leave it as my last slide. I said what is also important for us as local provider is that we have a European context that is really helping us to create that ecosystem that favors investments instead of only favoring price and consumer prices, that create a level playing field between provider regulation for uh, today a Skype or a WhatsApp is very different than regulation for telco provider, although we offer the same services. And that's why it's very much important to regulate on the service you offer and not on the technology that is behind. It was true and relevant, I think, 10 years ago. I think today it is not relevant. There is enough competition in Europe. One of the big uh, challenge and issue we have in Europe is that our market is very fragmented. We have a, ver a lot of players, a very fragmented market, and I don't think it's, uh, it's by accident that all the big players in the new digital worlds are coming from the Americas, or the, mainly the United States, or are coming from China, because they have the critical mass to grow. They have also a, a regulation that helps them to innovate. I think one of our main challenges, then more at the European level, is how do we make Europe evolve towards one more European market with less regulation, more permissive way to do innovation, and regulate ex post and not ex ante? Give to company freedom to innovate and regulate afterwards if there are abuses, but don't try to regulate everything beforehand because you kill innovation. And in the end, the only thing you will get is a very poor digital Europe and a Europe which we completely over flooded by US or Asian uh, competitor, which I really think it's a shame because we have a lot in our hands in Europe. We have strong skills strong um, innovation, strong creativity, and I think it's a shame if we are not able together to make that work and create also a digital Europe which is worth its name. Thank you very much. So, um, for those of you who were expecting Natalie Ray, I can confirm you're losing out. Um, but she's away uh, leading a meeting on GDPR adoption in Mountain View now, so you can be sure it's for the good cause that she's not with us today. Um, my name is Julian. I've been nine years at Google, um, half of the time here in Europe, half of the time in California, more or less, half of the time launching technologies in local markets like Street View or YouTube, some, some difficult technologies sometimes to launch. Uh, the other half working within the security teams in, um, in, in, in Mountain View, um, uh, assessing how we communicate security, our, our security challenges. For those of us who are working very close to technology, and I think this is all of us today, we all know how confusing and how difficult it can be to forecast anything in technology adoption. Uh, so... Uh, Typically, it's easier to focus and try to identify a fundamental trend. Uh, we say in French, tendance lourde, and, and then try to see how um, whatever technology comes sticks with that uh, fundamental trend. I picked one for today, um, and you know, it's this trend from individual activity to collective intelligence. And if you're uh, depending on your appetite on philosophical discussions, you can immediately see that this trend goes back a long way uh, before humans. Um, and whatever uh, you want to, um, 
even if you're not interested into the philosophical discussion, you, you will agree that in the last years, we have seen a lot of change happen on that, uh, along that trend. So from the arrival of the search engines, different of them, uh, you know, allowing us to tap into the collective intelligence and collective memory of the world, the, the, the social networks allowing us to interact a lot and exchange with friends that we will maybe not see anymore in our lives, but they remain friends. Um, all the way to cloud platforms that uh, abolish silos within companies and make data available that was, you know, until yesterday, just on the other side of the world, but completely inaccessible. Um, finally, to real-time collaboration platform. You know, these tools that allow you to solve problems immediately on the fly in the taxi while your team is in America uh, just before the customer meeting. These things, uh, these things can happen nowadays. So um, these, uh, these, this um, collaborative direction um, is not necessarily in sync with this kind of picture. Now, uh, now I'll, I'll, get to the, I'll get to the picture in a minute. Now, what fascinates me about this is one of the cornerstone of this collective direction is an extremely private, extremely um, uh, personal device, the mobile phone. We, we are not going to do it today, but we often do a, a thought exercise you know, with, uh, with smaller groups. And uh, to, to, to help people understand how private this has all become, we basically ask everybody in the room, do you have a mobile phone? Everybody has a mobile phone. Can you please take it out of your pocket? Unlock it. The screen is on. Now pass it to your neighbor. Okay? This is how personal technology has become. <clears throat> now, if this is not enough of an example, um, the last four years, you know, with, you know we, we, we mingled a lot with, uh, with other families in, in, uh, in Palo Alto where we were living. My son was a best friend with a, a small Israeli uh, uh, kid, and um, they had four children in that family, and they had an Alexa device, you know, this Amazon device, and this, you see the equivalent here, Google Home, um, which is this this kind of speaker that also becomes the interface um, uh, of your life, you know, with technology. I don't have one of those at home. I was personally a little bit neutral to skeptical about this kind of thing. I promise you, before, when you put this in your living room, this will become your next child in the family. Um, the, 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 the intensity of the interaction with that device was just disturbing for me, uh, being maybe a little bit uh, on the other side of the fence, on the age side already. But um, this, is, this is going to be really this new interface. You know, if you thought mobile phones were the ultimate intrusion or you know, however uh, you would uh, build your relationship with mobile phones, this is being, bringing it to the next level. <clears throat> now, as we kind of realize that these technologies are becoming sort of an extension of ourselves, and we get accustomed to that, and we allow for this technology to be, you know, using the information that it gathers, um, all of a sudden this also opens new doors, new possibilities. Um, and we believe that triggers, for example, the possibility to interact much more naturally with technology. And we will, you know, I'll, I'll go in, in a couple of examples about that one. Um, it also allows to automate a lot of the tasks that you used to do, and you can then focus on, on more productive, more elevated tasks. Ultimately, this technology allows you to become a real personal assistant and anticipate on what you will need, anticipate on the information you will need before you even know you are going to need it. If you think that this is the future, uh, whether or not you welcome it, there is a sentence, there is a saying, the future is now. It's just not very evenly distributed. 
You can already do many of these things, and I will just pick a few of the Google products or Google examples, but of course you will find the equivalent uh, in many other technology platforms available. If you store your personal photos online today, you probably have anything between 10,000 to 50,000 photos uh, you know, on a disk somewhere. Um, if you want to search through these photos through traditional, uh, I would say, machine or keyboard kind of uh, strokes, this will not work. Um, if you're not using Google Photos, I recommend you try it out. Um, you can search on Google Photos just by mentioning what you're looking for. Me, my wife, the mountains, my wife in the mountains, it all comes up. When we launched it a year ago or a year and a half ago, it was a great deal that we could differentiate between a cat and a dog. Today, Google Photos differentiates between 30 different breeds of dogs. We're not teaching that to the system. The system is teaching itself to recognize cats and dogs. So the natural communication, uh, voice enabled, of course, to technology uh, becomes very close all of a sudden, and you see it coming. If you're using Gmail, who in the room is using Gmail? Thank you. Okay, decent. Okay, well, that makes sense. Um, if you're using Gmail, you might have been using Inbox for Gmail. Who is using Inbox for Gmail? Oh, wow. wow this is, thank you very much. This is really uh, fantastic. Now, Inbox for Gmail has this interesting feature that when you receive an email, it understands the purpose of the email and automatically proposes you three answers so that you know the cadence at which you receive emails per day you receive the email and you automatically receive a couple of uh, possible answers and then you just tap on one and it answers uh, at the tap of a finger whatever you are more or less meant to answer of course because it connects to your calendar um, this is not yet done but it's coming very soon when you receive a request for a meeting one of the answers will propose the next possible slot for the meeting. So automating all these tasks that are really, you know, uh, uh, burdening your, your day. Another technology on the predictive side that we announced in October is Springboard, which is a tool that we propose to organizations to anticipate on the kind of document that you will need today. It knows what you did yesterday, it knows more or less the meetings that you have today. Um, it knows if you have time to work or you don't have time to work, you'll be meeting all day that are unrelated to that document. But anyhow, when you come in the morning, there are the documents available that you very likely will be needing to get onto your work today. No more fumbling into your folders hierarchy and trying or not, or not finding the latest version of your documents. So, this is all interesting examples of technology available today, your choice, whether or not you adopt it or not. And the second point I'm, I want to make is, change does not come through technology. Change comes through the use of technology or how this technology is being used. We conducted a research with the Economist Intelligence Unit earlier this year, and we found out that out of all the companies that have already adopted the cloud, so that's only a fraction of the rest of the companies. Out of all these companies, only 20% of these companies are actually using the cloud to change the way they work. The large majority of these companies or organizations are using the cloud a little bit the same way that they were doing it before. And of course, this is not really the purpose. You know, um, when you look at these few amount of organizations that were able to think differently about how they interact um, and the kind of reach and the kind of possibilities that they unleash all of a sudden, it really opens new horizons. Pokemon Go, we were, we were debating earlier on the benefit or non-benefit of Pokemon Go on our family balance um, recently. Uh, so that's something else we can talk about after. <laughs> but um, um, po Pokemon Go gained 50 million users in three days. Can you imagine what you could do if you could reach 50 million people in three days? Um, 
This is the kind of new possibilities that these technologies allow if you allow them um, to, to take place. You can then solve big problems, bigger problems. An example is, if you've been around using email in the 90s, and I see in the room we are more or less all in the case, which is a rare opportunity for me. Um, uh, but you will remember how in the 90s, spam was actually threatening the, the use of email as such. There was so much spam that you were, we were wondering if email would survive as a communication tool. If you are a Gmail user today, you have less than 0.01% of spam in your inbox. Um, it's not that there is less spam online. There's never been more spam than today, and it's still increasing by 4 to 5% per year. It is through the application of machine learning or advanced computing that you know, the systems are able to understand better what is spam and what is not spam and deliver you exactly what you want to remain efficient through the day. Another example that we um, just applied to ourselves, and I think it will apply to many of you running your own infrastructures and data centers, is the application of machine learning to cooling, for example, in our own data centers. Now, it's not that we were idle on trying to solve the cooling issues in our data centers or the energy consumption in the data centers. Actually, um, you know, I think today we deliver 3.5 times more computing power per energy unit than we used to five years ago. So we are always improving on these capabilities. But when we used machine learning, when we trained the neural model to learn how to cool our data centers, just by activating that technology on the system, we were reducing energy consumption by 40%. So energy consumption for cooling purpose, I, I need to be precise. Uh, but still, it reduced the overall energy consumption of our data centers by 15%. So the kind of problems that if you allow technology to use all that information that you make available through um, you know, the device and the technology that you use, you can, you can actually uh, tackle. And then, and then, of course, as a uh, public organization, um, or maybe just as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a citizen, as an engaged citizen too, you can make this kind of platform, this kind of technology available to others. And I want to highlight here uh, Sail Drone. Sail Drone is a startup I came across um, uh, in Palo Alto. Uh, they're just across the, uh, across the bay. It's a Brit and a Belgian. And they manufacture sailboats, automated sailboats, that now um, uh, sail around all the oceans, gathering data that was previously, that could only previously be gathered by very expensive, almost military expeditions, you know, through the oceans, millions of dollars a day or a week to gather the information. Now you have these self-supported sail drones roaming across the ocean, getting all the information that we were lacking and that we need to solve or address you know, large issues like water level changes, climate changes, fisheries depletion, um, just by finding positive ways and you know, optimi optimist waves, uh, ways, sorry, <laughs> waves is the picture, um, to use this technology. So I want to wrap on that um, and just you know, mention um, these tools that we are making are indeed changing ourselves, and it can be a little bit um, intimidating sometimes. Um, but end of the day, really, we of course really believe at Google that technology is on our side. Um, and embracing these changes will just be for the greater good. Thank you very much. Well, bonjour, monsieur, dames. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the future. Think about it. We're using digital to negotiate about our work, right? We send an email, we get a LinkedIn request, but then to execute the job, we still need to fly, we need to take the car, we need to use the train. So we need to displace to go from point A to point B to execute our work. Now, wouldn't it be great if we had an internet which would allow us actually to do that very thing remotely? 
if our best doctors on the planet could do an operation somewhere else on the planet. Our best engineers in Germany could uh, maintain a car in Africa. Our best engineers in Rolls Royce could do the very same on a remote island because a plane had a problem. Um, I could teach somebody how to play the piano or somebody could teach me how to paint. Now we can't do that, but we want to do that in the very near future. And uh, we struggled to give it a name, but finally I decided to call that internet the internet of skills. And it's, it's contrasting the internet we are trying to build for machines, right? You have heard of Industry 4.0, which is automating uh, manufacturing sites, etc. So we have been empowering with our technology machines, but we failed to empower the human being. So here we are, we're working on this internet of skills and uh, my, my dream is really to have that type of internet of skills uh, democratize labor the very same way as the internet has democratized knowledge. That's what we want to do. Now, um, from a tech point of view, you will say, hey, you know what, we are there already. We have uh, machines which could essentially have us do some teleoperation. In fact, I'll show you a tele literally a teleoperating surgeon device uh, later on. But let me zoom out. Uh, let's understand what the Internet has really undergone in terms of transformation the last uh, 30, 40 years. And if you look at the top chart on the right side, this is how our communications looked like 30, 40 years ago. If you're lucky, you had a Siemens video phone. Really lucky. But if you wanted to talk to somebody on that Siemens video phone, you needed that somebody also to have a Siemens video phone, and otherwise it wouldn't work, right? And you would use a network which was pretty lousy, loads of circuitry, probably even somebody manually switching things. Now zoom forward 40 years. We have done a massive amount of research and innovation, and a lot of that actually coming out of Europe. What have we done? Two important things. We invented IP. IP has decoupled the application layer from the link layer from the technology below so we could scale both. That's really great. And we invented codecs. So we take that for granted, but that allows me today on my, to take a film on my uh, Apple iPhone and play it on my Dell computer. Right? And that's really what enabled this economy to scale and the rest, as we say, is history. Now, when it comes to these, uh, what we call haptic networks, the ability to transmit physical work and touch, we are just like the Siemens phones uh, of the 1950s and 60s. Why is that? We have equipment today. We have it there. It's super expensive and it only works with the very same vendor. We want to get out of the uh, vendor login. I want to make sure that uh, in the future, by 2025, 2030, a Google control device works with uh, an ABB uh, sensor, right? You want to make this read to bring down the prices, uh, the costs, and scale the technology. So here we are. That's what we're currently pioneering and uh, around the globe. It's a global initiative, um, trying to come up with new codecs. So we are really after new codecs, uh, which would allow us to encode the information in a new way. We are designing an, uh, an entirely new network, ultra low latency. Why is that important? Because when you transmit skill, you transmit physical movement, you transmit muscle movement, you transmit action, and you want reaction. Reaction has to come within a millisecond, right? So those among you who do flight simulators, they know that. If the reaction to your action is not happening almost immediately, you get cyber dizzy, things don't work, control loops become unstable, etc. So we need to make it one millisecond. Now let's do the calculus. Speed of light, one millisecond buys you 300 kilometers. That means 150 kilometers to go and 150 kilometers to come back, okay? So how do you build a global network, a global internet with that constraint? Now we're doing this right now. I don't want to bore you with the technology, but that's what we're up to. When you're in London, please come and visit my lab. So we have now uh, some of the world's first haptic gloves where you can feel things. Our, our vision is that when you go shopping on Amazon by 2020, you will be able to feel the sofa or the cushion you're buying. Okay, we have that technology there. Um, we are able to move boxes. We are able to do things now across the Atlantic into China, uh, come and visit me. But what we are really trying to do is, is to disrupt the industries. And Dominique has uh, said something really wise before. Um, you know, you can come up with the most beautiful piece of technology if your final customer on the demand side does not understand what that technology is for, they will just not buy it. They will only see the cost rather than the value. So what I've done now in London is I reached out to certain verticals 
and said, hey guys, let's sit together. Let's do a co-design, what Dominique referred to, uh, really intensely together and see with that type of technology, this ultra low latency network, this 5G and beyond technology, really make a substantial difference to you as a vertical. So we went to uh, verticals which are either very good or very uh, uh, poor in London, and uh, one of the good ones is uh, the performing arts industry. So there's no sound on this. I'll just talk you through here. Um, you see Ali Hosseini talking here. He's one of the leading uh, artists on, on the planet, working with the National Theatre, the Battersea Arts Centre, and the Young Vic, which is a, a theatre in London. And us, so we are trying to come up with a new piece of technology which would allow us to disrupt the performing arts world the same way as Netflix has disrupted cinema. The simple question I asked my team is what does it take me to transmit a signal from point A to B so I could give the same sensations as if I'm in the first row of a Madonna concert, right? The opening of the Olympics. Uh, could we empower the viewers in the theater with that technology? Could we empower the artists to procure new content for uh, arts uh, performances ar around the world, right? So these are the type of questions we're asking with that type of technology. We came together in the National Theatre here with all these people and started designing the technology. And what seemed to be a very simple exercise turned out to be really, really complex. So Dominic was referring to that. Uh, it's a really complex exercise. In fact, you know, we started as technology and arts and we realized what we need to do, do is really take the end out of that. That's what Ali was saying. Misha, we need to take the end out of arts and technology. It has to become arts technology. New breed of people who understand both. So you're writing new pieces of art now, which works for technology. We're designing new piece of technology, which works for this type of art, right? So that's one of the verticals we looked at. The other vertical we are very keen on is medical. It's a huge uh, vertical in, uh, in Europe, particularly. And uh, you see here on the left-hand side, Professor Proker, and I'm very privileged to work with him. He's one of the pioneers in robotic surgery. Um, and he happens to be at King's College in London, so it's easy for me to take the phone and say, hey, Proker, let's do something together. So what you see him here actually doing a remote operation. So he is in London and is doing our operation to the Karolinska Institute in Sweden in real time during the conference. Why do we need robotic surgery? Because it's super precise, almost no blood loss. That means patients can go home after 24 hours, rather than being in the hospital for six, seven uh, days healing. So there is a, a huge uh, social impact. There's a huge benefit here. But to really um, kind of democratize robotic surgery, nobody has done that. And, and, and Proker told me, Misha, please give me back the feeling of touch because when these machines go in the human body, I can't feel things anymore. So we did that. Then he asked me, Misha, you know, I have to traverse all London, from North London to South London, just to be in the operating theatre, uh, not even with the patient, 10 metres beside the patient. Could we make that remote? We're doing this right now. So we designed 5G will be an integral part of that. Uh, slicing, uh, SDN for those skilled in the arts. We're doing this right now. But the one thing surprised me, the third point, he said, Misha, you know, my biggest problem is to train people, students. I can only do it one by one on this machine. It takes a long time, and if they're really poor in doing that, in the end of the day, you know, the whole effort was for, for nothing. Would it be great if whilst he does the operation, we could copy paste that very same skill set in real time, in situ, around the planet, and then enable teaching of any student in the world? And that's what we're working on, that internet of skills. So these are the type of challenges we're doing here. On the way, we have pioneered in your finger, which you see here, which Maria presented. Um, and uh, with that, I'm almost finished. The last one, the last slide I'm showing you is when I started to talk to consumers. So I said, hey, you know, let me talk to consumers and ask people, random people in London, what would you do if you had an internet of skills? Would you use something where you could actually teleport your, your skills around the, the globe, right? So it's a heavily uh, edited video. In the end, you only see two interviews. I can send you the link to the full one. Let's see if the sound works. So as a creator of video series Digital Futures, which focuses on tech for good, I tend to keep a really close eye on advances that have the capacity to impact our day-to-day -day lives. The tactile internet for me is certainly one of them. If we can see and hear things that aren't close by, why shouldn't we be able to feel them, right? To be able to use data networks to relay actual human touch would be surreal and it's attainable. To me, I think the biggest reason to get excited about this is the potential for health and education.
Then you've got the marrying of the two worlds of AI and the tactile internet. You could remotely control humanoid robots who would be performing surgery or other public services. It's the immersive nature of something like this that really lights my fire. It will be so nice when you touch your dad when he's traveling and then you can go through the computer and say hello and keep a while with him and then you can kiss him, you can kiss him, and you can kiss him. <laughs> so when my daughter said that, I knew we we're on the right streak for the development of that Internet of Skills. Thank you very much. Thank you.